As we come to this fifth uh, lecture in our little series on the parable of the ten virgins, uh, let me remind you very briefly before I erase the board what we have said so far, that uh, foolish virgins as well as wise virgins, nominal Christians as well as true Christians, they have a great many characteristics in common. They may both be members of the church, they may both be orthodox, they may both be anticipating the second coming, they may both be giving, they may both be praying, they may both be martyrs, and they both, may both be means of salvation, and yet one group lost, the other group saved. One group born again, the other not born again. These seven characteristics, any one by itself, all of them taken together, or fifty others, being possessed is no proof that a person is not a foolish virgin who when Jesus Christ comes again will find the door shut in their faces forever. Now we ask ourselves after eliminating all those false props on which people rest so constant, constantly, many of you may be assuming you are Christians for reasons like this which give you no basis for such an assumption, we've tried to take away from you these false props so that you'll be established on a real rock that will wage to stand up under the raging of the testing that is to come. Now, we asked ourselves the question, since it's perfectly obvious in this parable that the key to everything is the oil in the lamps, what it is. And you remember hastily at the end I indicated the evidence is quite clear that the oil in the lamps refers to the oil in one group and not in the other, the Spirit of God in one and not in the other. The oil is a constant symbol of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, but as we said, this is not an allegory we're dealing with here, and consequently we cannot say with any kind of dogmatic finality the oil means the Holy Spirit in that particular allegory. It's not an allegory, it's a parable giving us one basic thrust. But we said that what is suggested by the simple fact that in this marriage ceremony as described, oil plays this role, incidentally does refer to the Holy Spirit. We said that as a matter of theological fact, not allegorical correspondence, but as a matter of theological fact, the one thing being absent in a person who possesses a great many outward, excellent activities and works which would vitiate everything and make these persons spurious Christians, foolish virgins, hypocrites whom Christ disavows at that day, the one lack in persons like that would have to be the Holy Spirit. We know from the Scripture, unless a person is born again by the Spirit of God, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the only way by which church members who call Jesus Christ God, who steward their means and who look forward to the coming of Christ and who pray and are prepared to be martyrs and so on could still be disavowed by Jesus Christ Himself would be that they do not have the Holy Spirit. They have not been born again that in spite of all appearances to the contrary, these impressive activities of theirs are works of the flesh. We know from the didactic teaching of Holy Scripture that the Spirit of God has to change a person and be the motivation for all His doing if that person is to do truly good, good works and not bad, good works and be a genuine convert, be truly born again, be a wise rather than a foolish virgin. All right now, we have the evidence in that for a person to be a true Christian, a wise virgin, he must be possessed of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's presence or absence is the cue to this drama that Christ has told us about in the parable. The foolish virgins have everything but the Holy Spirit. and. That lack is altogether fatal. What distinguishes the wise virgins and enables them to accompany the bridegroom to the celestial wedding is the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, as soon as we say that clearly we are talking here about the oil of the Holy Spirit and the key to the parable and the key to conversion and the key to final redemption is always the Holy Spirit. The first thing we have to recognize is that this question will inevitably rise. What do you mean by the Holy Spirit's activity? The Holy Spirit uh, totally absent in some and totally present in others? What is the difference? Surely the Holy Spirit isn't totally absent from these foolish virgins. And you're not a perfectionist who would say that He's totally present in these wise virgins. When you say the Holy Spirit is the key to everything, what do you mean? Aren't there different kinds of work of the Holy Spirit? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And we do have to look more closely. That's just a general answer. We're focusing in on the answer. We have merely staked out the territory now. It has to do with the Holy Spirit, but you're right. We have to say more than that. There are two types of work of the Holy Spirit which are depicted in Holy Scripture, and I will refer to them as the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's put it this way. The work of the Holy Spirit Surely this has to do with that, but there is a work of the Holy Spirit first upon persons and secondly within persons. But even that will need further explanation. You're quite right when you ask the question, don't these foolish virgins have something to do with the Holy Spirit? Hasn't He operated upon them in any sense? Are they total strangers to the Holy Spirit? No. Indeed, the Holy Spirit does work in connection with the preaching of the gospel. These people, after all, profess the gospel. They've heard it someplace, and when the word goes forth, it's accompanied by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit works upon some persons whom He never takes up his residence in. He operates, as it were, from outside. One has to be very careful of these spatial figures, you know, because when you're dealing with a spirit up and down and in and out are not very satisfactory, but I hope you can get the fundamental ideas because we are time, space-bound creatures and we can't very well think in other categories. But the Bible leads us to believe that the Holy Spirit does operate upon people in a way that is profoundly different from His working within people. Let's look at Genesis 6, for example, where it says, "My shortly before the fall, uh, 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 before the flood, before the sweeping away of mankind because of its sin, we find God saying, My spirit will not always strive with men. My spirit, Holy Spirit, this oil, will not always strive with men. And as a matter of fact, He gave up striving with that whole generation and wiped them off the face of the earth, as you know. But you see, there is an indication of the fact that the Spirit of God does strive with people, work upon people. He isn't changing them, but He nevertheless is dealing with them. It reminds you of Christ's words that the Spirit will bear witness of sin and judgment, you see. He, right now, I'm absolutely confident that as a preacher of the Word, I have, working with me, nothing less than the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. When His Word goes forth, as it's going forth now, it doesn't return to Him void. It accomplishes what God intends it to accomplish, the Spirit accompanies it. This is just the sword which I'm wielding. He's the one who actually makes it penetrate the heart. I'm holding it. I'm His sword bearer, as it were. I give it to Him, and He wields it as He pleases. But since the Word of God, which is coming through my lips, is His sword, and He is the wielder of it, I can be perfectly confident 
and so can every other witness of Jesus Christ be perfectly confident that whenever he presents the truth, he's not alone. The Spirit of God is working with him to do what God in all his absolute sovereignty is pleased to do. So, we know that whenever the Word of God goes forth, as it certainly went forth to these foolish virgins, and it goes forth to people who haven't even heard the gospel, don't even know about the Bible as well, because He is infinite and, of course, everywhere, it can convict. The Spirit can convict. The Spirit can second the motion. It's almost as if He, for example, some of you in my invisible audience out there who may be being, being striven with right now by the Spirit of God, even as I talk to you, you may be saying to yourself, this man makes sense. I wish he didn't. It really bothers me, but I don't know how to refute him. This is, I remember once working with a fellow at a university. We, t we talked privately about original sin for two hours. At the end of that time, he said, Gerstner, I don't know what's wrong with your argument, but I hope to God you are wrong. He didn't like the doctrine, but he didn't know any way of defending it. He tried. He was very, very sharp. It really bothered him. And it may be with you. You say, this sounds right. I'm afraid that guy's speaking the truth, and I wish to God I could prove he's wrong, and so on. Well, the Spirit of God at that time, he isn't whispering in your ears, this is a witness of the truth. This man is conveying to you the Word of God. You better believe him. But nevertheless, in his own silent way, he's saying something like that. The Spirit, if he's striving with you, it's against your resistance. You don't like this idea that you have to be converted and that your salvation depends on someone else altogether and that this Holy Spirit is sovereign and whether he comes in your heart or not. After all, you're an American. You've declared your independence, not only of Great Britain, but of Almighty God. Nobody's going to tell me what to do, and I'm not going to be dependent upon anybody. And here this guy says, unless the Holy Spirit sovereignly chooses, I'm a lost soul. I don't like that. You'll fight with it, and yet it's the truth. And I think the Holy Spirit, as well as your own conscience, your conscience, of course, is on my side, and the Holy Spirit's on my side, and your own brain's on my side, that's the reason you're saying, I wish I could see through this argument. I could wish I could prove this isn't the Word of God. I could wish to, that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God. I wish I didn't have to believe in order to be saved. I wish the Holy Spirit's presence in my soul wasn't necessary for my being accepted forever and so on. You can say all those things, but you know, your wishing is no argument. You know full well if this is the Word of God and what I'm saying is a clear exposition of it and Jesus Christ is the Son of God, these things are so... And just because you don't like them doesn't make them wrong. And just because you wish they were otherwise doesn't make the other right. You're fully aware of that as a mind, as a conscience, and the Spirit of God as it were. Is at work in His own quiet and mysterious way, the way I put it, seconding the motions. All right now, that's the kind of work which the Spirit of God is always doing. And a person who has that type of work all his life and apparently God's Spirit does strive with some people virtually all their lives. I will not always strive, says God. With some people, He doesn't always strive. With some people, He hardly strives at all. But with others, He strives a long, long time. And He may strive right up to the edge of the grave. And He may be striving with some of you out there. And He may have been striving for years, decades, half a century. He may stop striving today, and he may keep striving until you die. But that would be a work upon you. That converts nobody. You're still a foolish virgin. You may know all about the oil, but you don't have it in your lamps. So the question still is, if the difference between the wise and the foolish virgin is the oil in the lamp, which being translated means the Holy Spirit. What's the difference between the Spirit in a wise virgin and upon a foolish virgin? The Spirit operating, as it were, from outside as over against inside. What is this within persons? 
There is a sense, of course, and even when you use this expression, as I say, we have problems with these spatial analogies. But nevertheless, there's a sense that even when he works upon you, it's within you. But at the same time, it's different from this. Now, let me see if I can explain this. Jesus puts it, you remember, except a person be born again. That's a pretty radical concept. Nicodemus, you know, actually thought he meant to be physically born the second time. That was pretty stupid to be sure, but Nicodemus at least got the idea of the radicality. He knew something fundamentally brand new, like his first birth, had to happen to him. He mistook it as referring to his actual literal rebirth physically. And he realized after a while that Christ was talking about a spiritual birth, but it was just as new, just as radical as that first birth was, which is the reason Christ isn't he didn't hesitate to say, you must be born again, born again. Well, you see, that gives us the idea. Now, this is obviously no operation from without merely. This isn't the Holy Spirit merely convicting of sin and judgment and righteousness as six, John 16, 8 says, and so on. This is actually the Holy Spirit becoming the very principle of behavior. We are given what is called a new creation in the epistles, a new birth by Jesus Christ. Something is planted within us that wasn't there at all before. It's a life brand new, just as truly as our first birth was the implantation of a brand new life that wasn't there before. It marked our birthday, and this too marks our second birthday of a spiritual character. So clearly the Holy Spirit has come into us in such a way that He becomes the basis, the spring, the dispos disposition of our whole behavior. Subsequently, we are born of Him, and here's Paul can say, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ, of course by His Spirit, Christ by His Spirit lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. For me to live is Christ. Now, Christ is exalted at the right hand of God the Father Almighty in His glorious perfected humanity. Christ in the Apostle Paul is the Spirit of Christ, the third person of the Godhead. So when he says, for me to live is Christ, what he is saying, for me to live is the Spirit of Christ, is the Spirit of God. Here is a true virgin, a wise virgin testifying to the oil in the heart the Spirit of God resident. So what's the difference? This is an act of the Holy Spirit upon a person convicting of sin and righteousness and judgment, striving with people to do what's right, to respond to the truth and so on, but leaving them to themselves and they, when left to themselves, constantly resist and resist and resist until sometime God says to them, I, by my Spirit, will not strive anymore. But sometimes... Sometimes God actually, by His Spirit, invades the soul. He pitches His tent there. He takes up residence. He's come to dwell. You know that figure in the Bible, to live permanently in the bosom of a saint. And He becomes thereafter the spring of all the person's behavior. Before. The thoughts and intents of his heart were only evil continually. Now, the Holy Spirit of God is inclining him to holy thoughts and spiritual aspirations and godly striving. That wasn't there before at all. Even when he did what was outwardly correct, he always did it for a fleshly reason. Now, he still joins the church. He still gives his money. He still bears his witness and so on. But now, it's an outpouring of love to Christ. And when it's said that He gives all His goods to feed the poor, it's not without love. If He gives His body to be burned, it's not without love. He goes to church, it's not without love. But anything He does 
is, as Paul says in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on. It's the Spirit who has borne this fruit in the Christian life because He is the principle of a person striving. That's the difference between the wise and the foolish virgin, and that's the principle by which we distinguish between oil in the lamps and oil which is not in the lamps, between what enables a person to be acknowledged by Jesus Christ and what cuts him off from Christ forever. Now we close in on what's the burden of this whole series of study, and I want to introduce it now and finish the discussion of it in our final lecture the next time. But remember the title of this whole series is, How to Know One is Born Again, or How to Know One is a Wise Virgin Before the Bridegroom Comes. How to know you really are a Christian. That's the big question. Alongside of that, all other questions are trivial whether, for example, we'll be blown up in a cosmic dust by nuclear fission and so on. Don't bother me with trifles. We're concerned with big things now. Being born again, not blown to pieces, that's nothing. That's just a transition from temporality to eternality. But being born again determines whether that eternality is going to be in hell or in heaven, with God or with the devils. This is the question that really matters being born again, and as far as you and I are concerned, the most important question we have to settle is how do I know whether I have been born again, whether I have oil in my lamps, whether I'm a wise virgin or a foolish one? That's the big question, and now we're ready to address it. I think what I'd like to do at the end of this presentation is just give you the three basic indications and develop them more fully and adequately as far as the time will permit in our concluding lecture the next time. But let me get them before you at this time. Here's our question. How do I know that I have been born again? How do I know that I have oil in my lamps? How do I know that I'm a true Christian? How do I know I am a wise virgin? Now, it's how do I know that the Spirit of God is resident within me and not merely operating upon me and convicting me of sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, I'll give three tests. As I say, I want to look at them more thoroughly next time, but let me get them before you as a conclusion of this particular lecture. And for convenience sake, I'll have them start with E so that you can remember them more easily. One way by which you can know that the Spirit of God is resident in your heart is experience, encounter, direct intuitive knowledge. Another way, in order to make these fit with the ease, I have coined myself. It's a barbarism. The word doesn't exist. Don't look it up in your dictionary, but I think you will know what I mean when I say extrospection. We're all familiar with the term introspection. That's really what I'm talking about in this first term here, where we look within ourselves very privately but very penetratingly to see what ticks and what kind of person we really may be. Extrospection is taking an inventory of our lives. It's checking our behavior. And this, too, can be done. And in a certain sense, this is what we have been doing in this whole exposition so far. And I want to show, before we're finished, how that relates to this and must be coordinated with this. But first, we'll look inwardly to see if we can detect the presence of the Holy Spirit. We'll give some guidance as to how that may be done, and then we'll check scrupulously and objectively 
and meticulously and mercilessly our outward behavior. And then the third test is endurance. Because even if we do pass, as it were, the test of experience, or think we do, and even after a thorough inventory of our life and checking ourselves in various areas of our behavior to see whether indeed we're what we profess to be and whether we are practicing what we preach and what we profess, still might feel well about ourselves at the end of that examination and think differently the next week. And one of the tests that the Scripture makes absolutely indispensable, and I may say by way of anticipation, this even threw the great Augustine off the path here. But nevertheless, it is a test, it's indispensable, and understood properly, it will not throw us off the path, but we must not only be able to experience the Holy Spirit, and by this extrospection to pass the most scrutinizing examination of the Word of God, but there has to be endurance in that pattern or else all is lost No, <laughs> But all is shown to have been spurious. You know the old saying, if you have it, you can't lose it. If you lose it, you never had it. So if you seem to lose it, it may be only seeming. If you really lost it, then you never had it. But this is absolutely integral. It's not only that our Lord says, those who endure to the end shall be saved, but all of Scripture teaches the same thing, that the saints do indeed persevere. Now that may raise a question in your mind even at this point. I'm going to let it gel there for a while before we address it in conclusion. How can I have any assurance now if I have to endure to the end before I am saved? Aren't you talking at loggerheads with yourself, Gerstner? And this is exactly what Augustine thought, and it's what threw him off. So once again, I've aggravated the problem for you to think about, but I am saying to you now, you may today be assured of your salvation, that you have oil in your lamps and be permanently assured without any fear of the future and at the same time maintain. These three are the tests, experience, extrospection, endurance. But when we come together for our last lecture, I'll try to make that clearer. In the meantime, you'll be examining yourselves to see whether you have oil in your lamps.